So we'll ask folks to keep walking in, I'll come back here and, and keep checking the attendance. However, um, I just wanted you guys to take a look at what I had done. I believe it was yesterday, if I could keep my day straight. Um, but I tried to like make it look nice and pretty so that it was easy to read and you could understand what was due when. So that seems to be the, the confusion, okay? Especially with the way that we have to do the discussions before we come to class and then we talk about something and then you go do homework, right? It's a little bit different. Um, so I try to kind of map this out by day. You won't see it like this if you're not in um, a, a website. So Chrome, I'm using Chrome. But if you're in a website and you're using the actual Canvas website, not on a laptop or a desktop kind of thing, okay? If you're trying to do it on the phone or on the tablet using an app, uh, most of the time it makes the website look like the mobile version of the website. And in that case, you don't see it the same. Or if you're using the app inside the phone or the tablet, it doesn't look the same at all in the app, okay? And so you won't see like these little labels that I have where it's like Tuesday and then we're doing this and this label here and it tells us what we're doing, this label there. You won't see none of that. All you see in the app are pieces like the assignments and then the test and all that kind of thing. So it, it looks completely different if you use the app. Um, I don't recommend using the app to view it, but it's nice if you have to like turn something in real quick on your phone, the app is helpful, okay? Um, let me see, Osvaldo or Ozzy. And then, so for this week, this is kind of gonna be the game plan. Um, we're gonna work on 2.1 and 2.2 today. So we're gonna talk about some examples. Um, I am gonna have you guys talk to me. So I really, really hope that you guys are engaged a little bit and that you actually respond. <laughs> if nobody says anything, I'll start trying to like, you know, have some trigger words out there, try to um, initiate some kind of uh, voice from you guys. But we will basically conduct the class as if I'm not going to write anything down unless you say it, okay? So I need somebody to say something always, okay? Um, and it should not always be the same person either. I need the if they're answering on time, I get it. They got it, right? <laughs> I want to make sure that everybody else gets it, okay? So we definitely have to kind of rotate and take turns on, on answering and responding to things. Eventually, once I realize like everyone is responding, then you can all do it in unison and it's not a problem. And I can hear when everyone talks at the same time, probably because I have multiple children, but I can hear different answers at the same time. So if you're both answering and one of you says zero and the other one says five, I can hear both and then I can know which one to address, okay? So I'll be like, yeah, five is the correct answer, but hey, let's talk about how you got zero because we need to fix something there, okay? Um, and so that's usually how I conduct the class. Now I am gonna try to stay up here. And the reason why originally I had wanted to go to, you guys go to the board. However, I don't have any kind of recording mechanism if we're all doing the board work. And I really feel like, especially right now with all of this COVID stuff coming up and down and all that stuff, there's chances that people are gonna be out every now and then, okay? And they might be out for a whole week. And so I definitely wanna have some kind of alternative for people who are in that situation, okay? I don't want it to be like, oh, you're just out because <laughs> sorry you got sick, but make your way by yourself, okay? I don't feel like that's the right way to do things. So I am going to record what we do here. So I'm already on record right now. Um, and then as I change my screen and we work on the papers, um, it'll all come out. Now it may or may not pick up your voices. So if you hear me repeat exactly what you said, it's not because I'm trying to be rude or talk over you. It's just because I wanna make sure that the speaker picks up whatever was said, okay? Um, so this is the way we have it right now. So as soon as this class is over, I will actually replace that one little strip with the recording of today's class. Okay, so you'll see the recording link in there once it's all said and done. Um, it usually takes about, I would say about an hour. So usually about five to 30 minutes for um, Zoom to actually give me my video. And then about another five to 15 minutes for me to take that video, go stick it in YouTube and then pop in the link in Canvas, okay? So I would say within an hour after class, it might be up there. Actually, I can't even tell you that. I would have to say by two o'clock it will be in there because I have a class right after this one. Okay? And so I won't be at the computer that whole time, okay? But as soon as 1.30 hits, it should already be there. I should be able to drag it over, copy the link and stick it in before two o'clock, okay? 
So by two o'clock, those links should be in there. If they're not in there, you can always shoot me a text and remind, right, when we set up remind. Um, and then you can let me know, hey, I don't see the video. Can you post it up real quick? And it probably took me like five minutes to put it in there. Um, now for the homework, since we are going to answer all questions for 2.1 and 2.2 today, and then we will most likely have um, class time to work on it yourselves on the computer, okay? And I'll walk around, you can ask me questions if you have questions because you're stuck on something. Um, and then once you're done with that web assignment, you are free to go. So I do have three that have already completely finished. For those that are not those three that are completely finished, well, they're finished with 2.1. I only have one that's done with both of them, okay? Um, but as you finish them, you can show me, hey, look, I finished, and then you're free to go for the day, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so then the assignments are actually going to be due on Wednesday. So it does give you the rest of today and then all of tomorrow to finish up 2.1 and 2.2 with anything else you need to, to learn or get in there to get it done, okay? And so then I have those two links to those two assignments right below that deadline. Then you see for tonight, or not for tonight, but tonight or tomorrow night, <laughs> at some point you wanna go in and watch the 2.3 uh, video. I think it's one, it may be more, but watch those video video or videos um, and then contribute to that discussion there, okay? Um, and then Thursday, we'll continue. We'll talk about 2.3. I really only wanted to concentrate on that one section because there's a lot of algebra steps in 2.3, okay? And so I wanted to make sure that we had time to like go through all of those algebra steps when we get to those examples, okay? Um, and then eventually on Friday, the 2.3 will be due. And then again, Friday night, you actually have to prepare for, for Tuesday's class, okay? So not only do you have that one assignment to do, but then you have two discussions because 2.4 and 2.45 are relatively small as far as like how long it takes me to, do, um, to work out examples. Um, so we should be able to cover both of those sections on next week, Tuesday, okay? And I think they are the last sections of the chapter. So once we cover those on Tuesday, your those assignments would be due that following Wednesday. And then there would be no videos to watch, right? Because there's no more lectures. <laughs> uh, but when we come into class on that Thursday, we'll be reviewing for the test. Okay. And then the test will most likely be the following week on week four. But you notice I don't have anything in there yet, right? I have the test, it's just not in there. <laughs> Why do I not have it in there? I don't know, I just didn't put it in there, but it's not in there. It will be eventually. Now, oh, that's fine, because we're face-to-face. -face. So in a face-to-face -face class, when it does come down to test time, I know it's like two weeks ahead away. Good morning. Um, I know it's two weeks away, but are you Tristan? Yes. And then you're Lucas, right? Okay. And then I just have Natalie. Okay, so um, what was I saying? Oh yes, I do give guys the choice when it comes to test time. So you can take your test online or you can take it in person, okay? And so if you do see the test there, but you're not gonna take it online, don't click it, okay? Just wait till you get to class and I'll give you the paper one and then you can take that one. But if you do choose to take the test online, then you'll see it there. I think I'm not gonna let anybody see it unless they actually told me they're gonna take it online. Cause then I can actually assign it to just the people that said they were gonna take it online, okay? It's an option. I always tell the story to students that I had super, I mean, I still have bad anxiety, but I had it real bad when I was taking math classes and I could do all my homework. I could read the book, do my problems, get all the problems correct, and then when I went into the test, I'd get a 50. And so I don't know why, like, is it because the word test is there? Is it because it's so quiet in the room? I have no idea why <laughs> I could not pass these tests, okay? But eventually I used some little psychological tools to help myself get through that. Um, and so I do understand that there are some people that need certain kinds of environments. Like in my Calculus 2 class, I already had a student tell me like, I can't take a test in a quiet room. I have to have something. And I said, well, take it online, have your TV going in the background. And as long as they're not talking about calculus, I don't care what's on the television, but at least you can hear some white noise while you're taking your test, okay? Um, and 
they're they should be okay with that hopefully it works <laughs> they haven't taken the test just yet okay but things like that i know it can be more comfortable for you right in your own environment and so i just wanted to give you guys that option it's a new option we didn't used to have that kind of option back in my day but now that we do it's worth offering okay okay so let me stop talking so much about everything but math right um let's get into 2.1 so for 2.1 i did pick a couple of problems does anybody by any chance have some problems from 2.1 that they wanted to talk about like that you saw in the 2.1 exercise and you were like oh, no i need help with that one if you did and i don't discuss it you can still let me know okay if we get through the end and you still haven't identified anything that you're stuck with, because I really want to tailor this class to you. Okay. So after you read those discussions, I would say go look at the web assign assignments and see what's in there. And if they look like, hey, those are pretty closely related to your videos, I think I could knock those out, not a big deal. Or if you see one in there, they're like, uh, I don't think I'm going to know how to do this. <laughs> Bring that one to my attention, okay, so that we can cover it in class. Because I promise you, you're not the only one that's looking at it like, what is this? <laughs> so, this was one that I kind of identified just because it helped me get the point across of what was happening in the section. So, the whole point of the section was to identify whether something could be solved using pre cal. And when they say pre cal, they don't mean the course pre cal. They mean anything and everything that you would have learned before calculus. So we're talking like arithmetic, algebra, geometry, everything, statistics, anything that you would have learned before calculus. Okay. Um, and then whether or not it's going to require calculus because everything we know up to this point is not good enough. Okay. And so we do have two situations in both of these. So in part A, I'll read all that in a minute, but in part A, it's obviously a common geometric shape, right? So when they tell me at the top to find the area of the shaded region, that one I could probably figure out using some geometry formulas, right? But the other one is a curve, and that because it's so curvy, there's not like an actual straight geometric formula that you could use to figure that one out and to be able to give me that area exactly as what it's supposed to be. Okay, you could give me an estimate, but you'll never be able to give me the exact answer, okay, with pre-cal information. Once we get to chapter five, which is at the end, um, you will know how to take the area of that thing and find the exact area, okay? Um, but that's not till we get to chapter five. I think the very last section, like 5.4. So something to look forward to, that's also something that I used to do in, um, college is I used to get my textbook and go look at the back of the math book and be like, what in the world is all this gibberish? It looks like craziness. And then eventually at the end of the semester, I'd go back there and look at it again. And even if we hadn't gotten to that chapter, it still made somewhat sense. And I was like, wow, I've come a long way because before I didn't know what this was and now I at least have an idea. So this is kind of one of those full circle problems where we'll come back to you at 5.4 at the end of the semester. So you'll see that we'll be able to actually take that whole area. So for the first part, it says, this is essentially what I've already said, right? If it requires pre-cal, use it, solve it, figure it out. If it requires calculus, then you basically have to come up with an estimate, okay? Then step one says that uh, in the figure part A, uh, this, in, this region is simply a triangle and you may use pre-cal methods to solve this part of the problem. First, determine the height and the length of the triangle shape. So looking at that image, I don't know if it's large enough for you, but looking at that image, what would you say the height of that triangle is? How many units? Mm -hmm. You go from that little peak, right? And that Y value happens to be three. Good. And then what about the length of its base? How many units is that? So I'm just gonna fill that information out down here. So the height was three units. The length of the base was five units. 
And then for part two, it says for me to compute the area of the triangle by employing a formula. So does anybody know how to find the area of the triangle? Yep. So my area is going to be one half the base times the height. And so in this case, the base is that length, right, of the base, which was five. And then the height was three. So what is half of 15? You got it. So 7.5. And this time, though, because this is units and this is units, my area would be square units. You could also write it like this. It's the same thing, right? With a little two. Okay, now the other one is it's not <laughs> any more complicated, but it's just a little weird to think about. So it says, consider the figure in part B, since the region is defined by a complicated curve, the problem seems to require calculus. Find an approximation of the shaded region by using a graphical approach. And then it has a really great hint. Treat the shaded region as approximately equivalent to a triangle on top of a rectangle and sum the areas of these objects. So if I go to my image here, what they're essentially telling us to do is to visualize this as one big rectangle and then a triangle on top of that, um, of that rectangle. So if I'm looking at the area of the rectangle, that's length times width, right? I should have asked you. <laughs> what would be my measurement of length here? How many units? Mm -hmm. The length would be this longer size, right? And so yes, those do go up to a height of three units. And then what is the width in this image? Just one unit. And it's not a negative because I don't care what the numbers are. I just care with how wide it is. And it's the width of it is one unit, right? So then the area of that rectangle is just going to be three square units. I can't squish it in there, but you get the idea. Now the triangle, what would be the base of that triangle? Correct. It's got the same measurement as this width, doesn't it? So it's also one unit. Now here's the weird one. What's the height of the triangle? It is. What you would do is you would take that peak, right, and drag it all the way down, just like we did with this one, right? And we figured out that measurement to get the height. We're going to do the same thing. But to go from three to four, that's just one unit, isn't it? So one half times one times one is, I'm gonna put it in decimal form and say 0 0.5. So if I'm trying to find my area of both regions, it's going to be the three units squared plus the 0.5 units squared, and I get 3.5 units squared, or square units, okay? That's what the word sum means, right? Let me zoom back out so you can get everything. Not too, too, too complicated, right? There is one like that. It's number five. So if you right there so on the 2.1, number five. Uh huh. Uh huh. I gave you the right answer. You should not do that, especially if they're telling you what to do. But <laughs> but you shouldn't because that that it. I guess so for this problem, it would probably be okay. I'm this is probably not going to be on a review or a test. So if it's okay for web assigned, then I guess you're okay. <laughs> but this problem would not be on a review or a test. And if it were, I would tell you specifically to do this. And then in that case, you wouldn't be following the directions. And so then therefore you wouldn't get the property correct. That makes sense? Okay. Um, 
the thing is, is that your approximation, if you did it that way, your approximation would be four square units, wouldn't it? Which is a greater error in the actual area than this estimate. But there is still an error in this estimate as well. That's not the exact error. That's not the exact uh, thing. And I can't even tell you what the area is because I don't know what that function is. I could guess what that function is, but I, I don't know what it is exactly. But if I did, <laughs> I could tell you the exact area. And it's probably close to 3.5, but not exactly. Okay. It's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. And it brings up the whole part of what happens on the test. Because on the test, I need to see specific things so that I can check that you're learning those specific things. So in the directions on the test, I am very specific about what I wanna see on your paper. And if you're not showing me those specific things, then I cannot give you the full credit. Not to say I don't give you no credit, I do do partial credit. But I definitely, if I'm asking you, do this, do this, and do this, make sure that you're doing those three things. We are going to get to a point where there are multiple ways to solve the same problem. And if I'm telling you, I need you to solve it method A, then you need to be doing method A, okay? Because I'm trying to see if you know how to do method A. And then the next problem will probably ask you to do method B, and the next problem will probably ask you to do method C, just so that I can make sure that you've got all three methods down. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm glad you brought that up because it does bring up that whole following directions thing, which is like huge in this class. And it's probably the biggest problem that anyone's gonna have is when they get an X or <laughs> you're wrong. They're like, what did I do? And it's probably because the directions weren't followed. Something in there. You gotta be real, real um, particular with your attention to detail in this class. Okay, so this one actually is gonna tie into that whole like great better approximations idea as well. Because notice here how they do, it's the same function, by the way. So for both of these graphs, it's the graph of y equals five over x, okay? And in the first one, you notice that they only have what, four rectangles, okay? And then you've got like this overage on each of these rectangles, right? So if I was trying to find the area under the curve, I would have an overestimate by whatever these areas are, okay? Whereas if you start putting more rectangles in there, so notice over here, now we have eight rectangles. Notice that the overages are not as much as they were before, okay? And if I were to put probably even more, like maybe if I were to go 16 rectangles, there would be even less overage on each part, okay? So the more and more rectangles that you put in this short interval, the more accurate your answer is going to be as far as your approximation. Now, again, we won't get the exact area until we get to chapter five, right? But we're gonna go ahead and follow the directions and do what they say. So this one says, use the rectangles to graph, or no, in each graph to approximate the area of the region bounded by those four graphs. Now they've already done all that for me. They've given me the graph y, uh, five over X. Uh, y equals zero is actually the X axis. X equals to one is like this line right here. And then x equals to five is this line right here. So you're basically finding the area in between here that's underneath the curve. And because we, we don't know how to do that exactly yet, we're using rectangles to approximate it, okay? Now, how do you think that we should be able to calculate this area of all these rectangles? Give me a game plan. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm going to call this one, I'll do this one in red and then this one in green. So I'm going to call this one uh, A1, A2, A3, and A4. Now, if I'm going to find the total area, I'm going to have to add all of those up together, aren't I? But how am I going to calculate what the area is of A1? They're rectangles, so they are going to be length times width, right? So I'm just kind of filling it out, length and width of the first one, length and width of the second one, the third one, and then the fourth one. 
So what would be the width for the first rectangle? How many units is that width? Mm -hmm. But what about the length? It is five. This one is very visual, right? You can see it there, that the top of it is five. So that's great. What is the width of the second rectangle? One as well. They all are gonna be, right? That one's one unit and this one's one unit as well. The links are a little bit more complicated because they don't have an exact spot, right? If I wanna look at the height of this rectangle, it's here and that's not exactly at three. So how do I figure out what that, what that height is? Exactly, you're right. I need to figure out what this Y is for that X, don't I? How do you suggest we do that? You got it. They gave us a formula, right? So they told me how to figure out the Y if I know what X I'm talking about. So since I'm talking about two, I'm gonna write five over two. Now, what about the next guy's height? What is this guy's height? It looks like it's touching the graph there. So what should I put for the length here or the height? Five over three, good. And then finally, the last one, five over four. Now here you need to use your handy dandy calculators. And I do wanna point out something because I noticed, it's not my fault, I didn't do it, but, the, the department has standardized what calculator we're allowed to use in this class. I think I mentioned that on the last Monday. So we're not allowed to use graphing calculators. So when you're doing WebAssign, I noticed that just about every single problem says verify in your graphing utility. <laughs> you're not gonna be verifying in no graphing utilities, okay? <laughs> we're gonna hope we did everything good and it's, and it's good to go. <laughs> But we won't be graphing. I mean, you could, you could go to Desmos on Google and go put it in the calculator and see if it's right. But we won't be doing that, okay? Because we're not allowed to have that graphic. I wish I could make that little comment go away on WebAssign, but I can't, okay? So it's just stuff there. But I don't want you to think, well, it says use a graphing calculator, so I should be able to use one. <laughs> just ignore what the WebAssign says about that, okay? Um, so I'm gonna actually type all of this in there. So five times one plus five over two. I don't even need to do times one, do I? They're all gonna be the same thing. So just five over three plus five over four. And I get this number, but I'm pretty sure it asked me for decimals, right? So there's a button on here. It's a double arrow down at the bottom. That goes back and forth between exact answer and decimal answer. So right now, whether if I have radicals or fractions, it'll give me that as default. But if I hit this, it'll actually give me the decimal representation as well. And so that's going to be three decimal places is gonna be what? 10 point what? Yep, you got it. So that's how many square units that area is. Now for the other one, we're doing pretty much the exact same thing, but how many rectangles do we have this time? Yes. So unfortunately, we have a little bit more to do. So for the other one, I'm going to be doing A1, all of these guys, just bear with me, I gotta write it down. So when someone else looks at it later, it makes sense, okay? And when I post the video, I'll actually post the link to all of this stuff as well. So everything that I write down, I'll post it as well. So let's talk about area one. So we know that the widths are not one unit anymore. What are the widths? They are, there are, because they cut it directly in the middle, right? So we would say uh, one half. And then what about those heights? 
So for this one, the height is what? Five, that one's pretty easy. Then the next one is also the same, one half width, but what is this guy's height? There you go, you got it. Five over that X value, right? Which is 1.5. Good. Do you see the pattern? Does everybody see the pattern? Because I'm not gonna just keep scribbling unless I know everyone sees it. <laughs> okay. So then what's the next one then? Five over two. And then the next one. Five over 2.5. Mm -hmm. And then five over three. So we've gotten up to this one. Now we're on the next one. And then five over what? 3.5. Five over four. And then I think we're at the last one now. We're here and it's five over what? 4.5. So this one's a little bit more annoying as far as me having to type it in the calculator. However, think of all your algebra properties. If I'm doing one half times every single term, couldn't I factor that one half out? Right? No, I can't factor out five over five, only because it's not five over five for every single term. No, no, he's saying because because the last one. Oh, this one, the height is not here. The height is here. So notice that over here on this rectangle, the height comes from the left point. This rectangle height comes from the left point. So when I get to that rectangle, the height comes from the left point. Okay. On the right side, you're right, it is five over actually five, right? But that's not where the height of that rectangle is. And it's only because it's so small, you can't really see it. It's my big fat pen. <laughs> I think it will be fine. You can see that it's clearly over that little mark. Okay. So if I were to zoom in on WebAssign, this rectangle, because of the way I drew it, because I'm not perfect and I'm not a machine, it looks more flat. But on WebAssign, there's actually some overage over here. Okay. No, no, you, um, you have to ask those questions because you have to visually see it. <laughs> so I'm glad, not a problem. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add all of these other factors together. So five plus five over 2.5 plus five over three plus five over 3.5, plus five over four, plus five over 4.5. And I get this number, but then that number has to actually get multiplied still, right? Because those are all of the heights. And then now if I multiply by one half, I get 6.2281. Actually, if I'm supposed to round the three decimals, what's it going to be? Yep, you got it. So notice that there's a lot of overage. Isn't there four whole units squared, right? More overage if you did it the other way. And most of it's coming from that first rectangle. Okay. Notice how you chop that almost in half, right? When you split the rectangle. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is another method. And we actually do, when we get to chapter five, we'll do both and then compare them. You are right. Okay, so I've kind of already answered this question, but let's see if you're paying attention. <laughs> it says, describe how you could continue this process to obtain a more accurate approximation of the area. So one is to continually increase the height of all the rectangles. Is that going to be it? What will that do? 
Uh huh. Because if you're increasing the height, aren't you increasing the area? Right. And then that's not helping us. <laughs> We're already got overage. We would have way more overage. You're right. What about continually decreasing the number of rectangles? Right, it's like going backwards from there to there, right? Didn't this one have more overage than this one? Okay, good. What about continually decreasing the height of all the rectangles? Right, because then now you're not gonna have overage, but then you'll have what? Underage, and it still won't be quite there. You can, you can for sure. Now, what about continually increasing the number of rectangles? That's the one. Because we already know just from going from four rectangles to eight rectangles, we already lost some of that overage and got closer, right? And so if I were to do it again to 16, I'd get even closer to my actual area, okay? So it is going to be the flat one. You have to increase the number of rectangles. I thought it was gonna need a lot more space <laughs> than I needed, but that's okay. Okay, so for 2.2, this was the one where we were doing the limits. So we just started limits in 2.2 and they started with the numerical approach and then eventually they went to the graphical approach. Now the numerical approach, I have every confidence in the world that you know how to type things in a calculator. And that is literally all that's happening here. And then you're making an inference at the end. Okay, so I'm pretty sure there's not too much complication going on with number three, but I just wanted to cut this concept before I go and look at the graphing one. The graphing one does cause a little bit of a challenge. Um, and I think that challenge is gonna address more when I get to a different question, okay? Um, and then I also noticed that I had a lot of people like, what is this? What is a proof, first of all? And what is this epsilon delta stuff, right? when you were watching the videos. So I definitely wanted to go over one of those limit problems. There is one of these on the test. So I definitely need to make sure you know how to do it, okay? Um, and I had some confusion. I tried to answer all of y'all's comments. So I don't know, in the past I've had a problem where a student will comment, I'll comment back, and then that student will never know that I commented back. Um, it all happens to do with how you set your settings in WebAssign. So if you want to be notified that I commented back, then make sure you have your settings stating so, okay? Um, but I did try to comment to everyone who commented on those discussions. So you, I may have given you like a pointer or tried to explain something, but hopefully I can address all those things when we get to this question. And then this is the last one that I have for today, okay? And then we'll just be working on WebAssign. So for here, it just basically tells me to complete this table. And then eventually it tells me to reuse the results from the table to estimate the actual limit. So the whole idea of a limit is you have an X value and you have either a function or a graph. The graph represents the function, right? What you're trying to do is you're trying to guess where that Y value is going. So if your X's are going towards somebody, then as they go toward that somebody, where are the Y values going? So in this particular case, it looks like X is going towards zero. So I don't have the graph of this thing, nor do I want to try to figure out how to graph this thing. I do not like graphing trig functions, um, even though I teach pre but I don't like to do it. It's not something I want to do. But, um, so the other way to do it without graphing this thing is just to do this numerical approach. So essentially what they're doing is they're trying to make all the X values approach zero from both the left side of zero and the right side of zero. So they went real close to zero already. Isn't 0 0.1 and negative 0 0.1 pretty darn close to zero? But they got even closer. So not only are they a tenth of a way, now they're a one hundredth of a way. Then they even went down to one thousandth of a way. Okay. So they're just getting closer and closer and closer to that zero. And hopefully it'll be surfaced what the heck the Y's are doing. So I'm gonna type this in here and I don't know if you have this calculator, it does it. If you don't, um, you'll have to use a different kind of calculator. So I'm gonna type in a fraction and then six cosine X, close my parentheses, minus six over, 
over x. Now I'm going to ignore this first answer because I do not remember. I must have had zero stored in there. Let's store the first value then. So I just put in the number I'm going to plug in, and then I click the store button, and then the x, and I hit enter. And all it does is it tells my calculator when I type in x next time, it's going to be um, as negative 0 0.1. And this prevents me from having to retype that function for every single number that I got to plug in. Okay. So it does give me, go ahead. It doesn't forget you. Yeah. You constantly have to change it. And you should change it first before you start trying to use X. I just try to do it without it. <laughs> I usually sometimes just plug in the expression and then I ignore whatever it says at first because I know I didn't put anything in there. But it didn't like it because it was zero. <laughs> but yes. So let's see. Let's round this one to how many places? Four places. So four places means 0 0.2998. Now I'm going to go negative 0 0.01 stores x. Hit enter. And I'm going to use my arrows to go back up to that expression that I don't want to type again. And I'm going to hit enter to copy it down into my input box. And then I'm going to hit enter again so that it actually plugs in the X. Okay. And I get 0 0.2, nope, 0 0.029. Oh gosh, this one's not going to let me, is it? I'm just going to put, it wants four. I can't. I have to put three, don't I? If I'm rounding to the fourth decimal place, it has this what's called the cascading effect, right? So this is the fourth decimal place, but this nine is going to make it go to 10, isn't it? Which is going to make that one go to 10, which is then going to make that one go to three. Okay. So my my uh, rounded answer is just 0 0.03. Let's try the next one. Or as X, go back and highlight, enter, enter. Oh, this one gave me a, <laughs> a fraction. That's not what I want. There we go. 0 0.003. Now we're going to go to the positive. So 0 0.1 stores X, positive. So highlight my expression and hit enter. Oh, that's not right. Negative 0 0.2998. Now the next one. That's going to have the cascading effect. So we're going to get this. And then now the last one. Oops, I get negative 0 0.003. So what is happening here? It went from about 0.3 to about 0 0.03 to 0 0.003. If I were to go even closer, right, it'd be probably 0 0.0003 on the positive side. And over here, the y values are actually on the negative side. But in both cases, what number are they approaching? Zero. And so then that's the way you find the limit, but numerically. Now, again, it says to check using a graphing utility. I don't have one. But if I were to go to Desmos, I could literally type in this thingamabob that they have there. So I'm going to do parentheses six cosine um, of x minus six, and then outside that parentheses, I'm going to hit divide by x. And so this is what it looks like. And if I'm approaching um, zero from the left hand side and from the right hand side, what is happening to the y? Where is it going to? It's going to that zero, right? So that's just to confirm that what you did on paper was correct. 
although we won't be using graphing calculators, and especially not if it's telling you to find the answer numerically, right? Okay, so now the graphing ones are a lot like that one, very, very visual. There's really nothing to write other than the answer because you're just looking and then answering. So they have this function and it's already graphed for you. And it says, find the limit if it exists. So the limit here is as X approaches negative one. So where's the Y value or what is the Y value as the X approaches negative one? I heard zero is an answer. Is that everybody says zero? Why is it not negative one? Almost. An open circle means there's nothing there. So there is nothing there. But the thing is, and I'm, and I'm gonna get to it on the next one, is that there's a difference between where the Y value is defined, right? and where the y value is going, right? And when we're asking you for a limit, we're not asking you for what the y value is, right? Which is down here. We're asking you where was the y value going, right? And so that is why this is zero. Because here, if I'm approaching from both sides, isn't it approaching, it's going to this spot right there, right? Even though there's nothing in there, it doesn't matter. That's where I was going, okay? And so that is going to be the limit. The limit is here, happens to be the same number zero. It won't all be zero. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. So another visual one, got this graph there. This one says, what is the limit if it exists? So as I'm approaching X equal to negative two, what is the Y value here? Or where is the Y value going? Mm -hmm. Got it. Exactly. So from the left side, I'm approaching this y value, right? And then from the right side, I'm approaching that y value. They have to be approaching the same value, like over here. They have to be going to the same spot. If they're going to two different spots, then you're right. The limit does not exist. And I think in the cap in the computer, you write D and E in all caps. Okay. But it just does not exist. Good. Now that whole situation will come back later. I think when we get to two point four. Now we're getting further. Now this is the weird one. This was the one where I was talking about that discrepancy between what the y value is versus what the y value is approaching, right? So for here, it says find f of negative two. So what is the y value when x is negative two? And if there's not one, what do you say? Does not exist. Is this one that does not exist or does it have an actual y value? Right, you got that dotted line, right? Nothing there, <laughs> so it does not exist. Now, what about the limit as X approaches negative two? Correct. They're going in completely opposite directions, aren't they? Okay. And so then in that case, we would also say does not exist. Now, I am going to talk about something because later, well, I'll talk about it in a minute. It's going to come up. And right now your answer is going to be one thing. And then as soon as we cover another section, your answer is going to be something else. <laughs> so this is going to be worth talking about. Um, what about F of zero? Yes, the actual Y value there is three because when X is zero, the solid dot is up there, right? Good. What about the limit as X approaches zero? Why does it not exist? Mm -hmm. This one's going to like one and a half, right? But this side's going to three. So they're not the same. Good. Okay. 
Now, what about f of q? Right, it's not defined. Is there a solid dot anywhere in the line of x equal to q? No solid dot, right? So this point does not exist. Good. What about the limit as x approaches q? About 0.5, yeah, that's a good guess, yeah. Again, I'm on a graph paper, right? So it's not obvious. <laughs> but on the computer, it's, it's a little bit more defined. But yes, that is correct. Those, both sides were going to the same spot, weren't they? And that y value was about a half. Good. Here's the one that's the weird one. So what is f of four? F of four, yes, the y value there is zero, good. Now, what is the limit as x approaches four? That's where it's gonna get weird. It's gonna get weird. Because <laughs> I hear infinity and then I hear it does not exist. And depending on what section they're in, they're both correct, okay? So if you're in 2.2, the answer is does not exist. But once we get to something called like improper limits, the fact that these are going to the same place, they are both going to infinity, aren't they? And positive infinity. Then you could also say that the limit is infinity, okay? So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Be careful with section you're in because if you're in 2.2, you have to say does not exist. But after 2.2, if they're both going to positive infinity, you can say the limit is positive infinity. And if they were both going down to negative infinity, you could say the limit was negative infinity. But if they're doing this business, one in one direction and one in the other, then it truly, truly does not exist no matter what section you're in, okay? Okay, here's the weird one. <laughs> there is one of these in the homework. There are two proofs. They're not one in the homework, I don't think, but there's one in the review and one in the test. And this one and another proof that we'll eventually get to, I think in 2.4, 2.5. Um, but this is the first one. So this one says, prove the limit statement is true using the epsilon definition. And I cannot tell you, I'm gonna warn you now. Following the instructions, right? Now we already brought that up today at some point, right? <laughs> if you go and plug in negative one and show me that this, after you plug in negative one is equal to three, you have found the limit, but you have not proved that this equation is true using the epsilon delta definition. One, you haven't proved that the statement is true, and two, you never use the epsilon delta definition, right? So I'm not asking you to plug in negative one <laughs> and calculate that it's three. That is not what I'm asking you to do. I'm telling you to prove to me that this actually equals this. Like prove it using the epsilon delta definition. Now, the epsilon delta definition says a limit exists. I cannot spell. And when I say limit, I mean as x approaches c of f of x equal to l, if and only if this statement implies this statement. Okay. So that is what the de epsilon delta definition tells me. So um, not only does it tell you that it exists, but it also tells you that this thing is actually, the L is the actual limit, okay? So there's like another sentence to the whole definition. Okay, so then our goal is to basically start with an expression that looks like this, do some algebra to it, and end up with this expression, okay? The thing is, is I don't know what to do <laughs> if I'm trying to turn this into this. I don't know what steps to take, okay? 
I don't know if I should be adding five to both sides of the equation, minusing five from both sides of the equation, dividing both sides of the equation by five. What am I supposed to do to make it turn into that? Okay. That is why I had you guys do that side work in the video. Okay. So the side work is to do two things. It's one to give you a delta for every epsilon. Okay. So once I can establish a relationship between delta and epsilon, if I give you one, couldn't I plug it into the equation and give you the other, right? So then you're giving that for every delta there exists an epsilon, blah, blah, blah business, right? Because you would have a formula for every single delta for every single epsilon, okay? So if you can find that relationship between delta and epsilon, that's what you need to even start the proof, okay? So you know what to magically plug in here so that after I do all my algebra to it, it ends up like this, okay? So you've got to find that relationship between delta and epsilon. The second thing that you need to do is you need to figure out what are you going to have to multiply by, divide by, add, subtract, all that good stuff to get this simple statement into a more complicated one. And the complicated one has to match something exactly. So I like to write out my goal first. So my goal is to show you that X minus, what is C in this case? Negative one, less than delta implies an F of X. What is F of X? Mm -hmm. And then minus L, what is L? Three. So this is my goal. My goal is to prove that that thing will eventually lead to this thing. My problem is, is I don't know how to make this thing equal that thing, okay? One, I don't know what the relationship between delta and epsilon is. And two, I wouldn't know, do I multiply by seven thirds? Do I add seven thirds? What's happening here, right? Um, so that's why we do this side work. So I, I'm gonna cut this in half and then I'm just gonna do my side work over here. It is much easier to take the more complicated thing and simplify it down into the more simpler thing. I mean, y'all been taught that since the beginning of elementary. Don't you always take the crazy thing and simplify it down to simpler, right? You don't ever go backwards and that's what they're asking us to do here, okay? But that's what the teachers are doing. The teachers are the ones coming up with the problems, right? Not the students. So you're not used to doing that backwards situation, okay? So we're gonna do what we're used to, which is to take this crazy thing and make it look like that one. So the first thing you would do here is what? To simplify it. Okay. That looks funny with the three epsilon, but yeah, that's okay. Now, if I multiply by positive three, that's the same as multiplying by the absolute value of three. Do you agree or disagree? Because I can't just put that three in just because I want to. It has to be in bars before I can put it in there, okay? But isn't this equivalent? Doesn't positive three equal the same thing as absolute value of three? Right. Okay. Now that it's they're both in bars, now I can put them all together. And so I can put it in the bars with the rest of it. And then you can actually do your distributing, which is what I'm sure you were wanting to do, right? <laughs> so that three will cancel this one. And then what do I get here at find the minus? nine yes and then here i'm going to get negative 2x minus what two good okay any suggestions from here more than two negative two yes because what's in here that's actually x plus one, right? So my goal is to try to make this have an x plus one, okay? 
So yes, we do have to definitely factor out a two, but to make it X plus one, we want to factor out a negative two. Now think about what I did with that three and stuff. If I wanted to take, put the three in, I had to have it in bars, right? If I want to take my negative two out, what's going to happen to it? Yes. And what is the absolute value of negative two? This two. And then this, for the sake of what I'm, my goal is, I'm going to rewrite it like that. Is that equivalent? It is. And then how do I get just the bars all by themselves? And so then essentially what you've done is you've created a delta here because that's what was on this side, wasn't it? Was a delta. And so now I have an expression for delta that's in terms of epsilon. So for every epsilon, I can figure out a delta that goes with it. You give me what epsilon is, is it 0.5? Okay, I'll plug in 0.5 and I can tell you what delta is, okay? So for every single epsilon, I will have a delta. And it has this exact relationship. Now, here's the weird part. Because <laughs> I have to start with this and a delta and make my way back up to here. Okay, That's the proof. The proof is starting with this side and then making your way to that side. And this is why this is super important because I, might have thought to multiply by two to get epsilon by itself, but never in a million years would I have converted the two into an absolute value of negative two. Never, I would have never thought to do that, okay? But because we did it in this direction, we have that clue right there on the paper, okay? Because if I don't multiply by that negative two, I'm never gonna get this inside the bars, am I? And if I don't get that inside the bars, I definitely cannot get this or the next step, or the next step, or the next step. But like I said, I would have never thought to rewrite two as the absolute value of negative two had I not done my side work first. Okay. Let me zoom out so you can see it all together. So now we're actually gonna prove it. So here's my proof. I'm gonna start off with this, less than delta, and then here's the kickstart of it. Let me let it focus and then let me. There's a thing on the ball, I cannot do it. Oh, there it goes. Let's just stop doing this. The first thing you need to do is you're going to say let delta equal epsilon over three epsilon over two. That is the relationship that I need in order to continue my proof. Okay. Without that decimal, without that statement there, I cannot get from delta to epsilon. So then we're going to put it in there. So this is going to imply that this relationship is less than three epsilon over two. And then we know we want to end up with this over here by itself. So what would be my first step to get the epsilon by itself? Mm -hmm. You have your hint over here because you got to go back up. So the first thing that we would do is go to this step, right? Where we're multiplying both sides by two. When I multiply both sides by two, I get this. And I can change that to a plus one, no problem. And then the two would no longer be there. What's after the two? What do we do next? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to do that next because I still need to get this guy in there, don't I? Right? Now here's the big question. Are these two statements equivalent? They 
they are equivalent. So I have not done anything illegal or <laughs> out of my jurisdiction to do. This is totally two same statements. Okay. Well, now that they're both in bars, I can bring the two in. And then I can distribute that too. Then, because I know, and again, I would have never thought to break up this negative two as a positive seven minus nine. Never would I have thought to just do that, right? But because we have these steps, we know that we can. So I'm going to do seven minus two X minus nine. Is this line equivalent to the line before it? It is. It's just, I would have never thought to do that if I hadn't had this over here on the side, okay? Then going backwards, I would have never thought to try to factor out a three from these spaces either, okay? So my next step is gonna be to factor out that three. And I'm gonna group these two together and this one separately. Again, the only reason I know to do that is because of this side work, okay? So then when I get this, I'm gonna factor out a three. Those are not divisible by three. So essentially it causes it to be a fraction. So that this times this gives me that expression again. However, nine is divisible by three. It's three, isn't it? And so again, when I distribute my three, I should get the same line up above. So these statements are equivalent. And then what do I do from there? Then I take out the three from the bars. So, okay, you factored out the three, take it out of that bars. And then what am I gonna do with that three? Mm -hmm. And if I divide it, won't it make three go away on both sides? And don't I have what I was trying to find? Isn't this f of x minus the l, right? And so then we're done. Depending on what book you write, you can write QED. Some books have like a little box. I literally used to put winky faces. And then somebody told me I was flirting with my teacher. <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess I better not do that. <laughs> but mm -hmm. yes. Well, this means therefore. So it's not exactly the same, but I don't care. As long as I'm done. I think that's another thing I used to write on my paper. Just done. <laughs> We're finished. <laughs> Well, your answer is the whole thing. <laughs> this whole thing is your proof. And I'm sorry, but you have to type that whole thing into Canvas. So you definitely have time to type that whole thing into Canvas. And I will show you how to do it in Canvas, actually. Let me pause real quick because you do have to do it. Like if I look at your review, Oh, this is the note sheet that you get when you take the review. It's the same note sheet that you get when you take the test. So it's literally all the definitions and theorems that we cover, like there in one spot. The annoying thing is you have to scroll up and down for the information, but it's not too bad. Um, uh, where's my problem at? Here it is. So it's something like this on the review. You all have the same problem when you review. But if you want to type this in, you need to use these three little dots. And then you see that square root thing. Some of you have already figured out how to do it in the in the discussion, because it's in the same, it's in the discussion too. So if you wanted to type in equations and stuff, you can do them in Canvas. So for instance, for me, the first one I have to start with is that bar. I actually use the keyboard because right above your enter button, you have a like a backslash, and then you have like this. It looks like two lines, but it's not. If I hit shift and I hit that key, it pops up the absolute value bars. Then I would type in x minus parentheses negative one. 
Then what is next? Less than, less than symbol. And then I need a Greek letter, which is Delta. And you can type in each line like that. You could say let, however you wanna do it. It takes time, which is why you have that whole two hours. This test, when I took it, it literally takes me, besides the proof, besides this proof, it probably takes me about 10 minutes to do the whole test. But the proof is gonna take you a good 15, 20 minutes because you have to type it all in there, right? Doing this, it takes me a long time because I'm talking it out, right? But if I was scribbling this on the test by myself, this part would take me like maybe a minute or two. This part would take me about maybe three or four minutes, okay? Just because I have to be careful when I go backwards. But then after that five minutes on that problem, you're probably gonna be spending another five, 10, 15 minutes just trying to type it in, okay? Um, but I do need you to type them in and don't skip both steps, okay? Especially if you're on, well, you only have to do the typing in part if you're taking the test where? Online. If you're taking the test in person, you're turning this in, right? <laughs> so you don't need to be typing nothing in nowhere. But I did wanna bring up this equation editor because Sometimes when you're trying to tell me <laughs> about equations in the chat, in the discussions, I don't know what you're saying because it's just a bunch of words and I have to like literally write the equations on the paper myself, okay? But you can use that if you need to like type something in real quick, okay, in the discussion. Does anybody have any questions over 2.1 or 2.2? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could have. I could have divided by three. Well, you have to be careful because you could have. You could have divided by three. Let me get another piece of paper because I don't want to write it on here. But you could have. So if I were to have taken that and divided both sides by three from the beginning before doing all the rest of it, you just would have had to have remembered that in order for you to bring that in, it has to be in bars, right? So you just stick it under bars, epsilon's by itself now. Then when you bring it in, you also have to remember that it has to get grouped. So yes, it'll all be over three, but you wanna group them. And then you probably could have done that in your head, but I'm just gonna write it out. Well, you get the same thing, don't you? So yeah, the only time I don't suggest it is when you have to turn something into a negative. I would suggest you do that negative business first and bring it in and then deal with the positive one later. But yeah, you could have done it here because I already brought the negative two in, didn't I? Good question. Just always keep in mind what your goal is. Your goal is to go from here to here. I just like, if I already did it, I'm just gonna go back up the exact same way so I don't confuse myself. <laughs> That's just me though, okay? Okay, um, so for now, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna go help, um, is it Annika or Nika? Annika, um, I'm gonna help her get into WebAssign. You guys already have access to WebAssign. And um, for the rest of the class period, we're just going to, be working on our website. If you finished our